What's up guys, welcome to another Steam free to play review and today we have In the Pause Between the Ringing which all I know about this is it's an action game which doesn't really tell me much, it's made by that college um, Mouse look, something something, sounds good to me This work is adapted from an unpublished story by Mir Ma Herzan I probably butchered that, written by Gudger Oh, even Gujarati poet in 1958 for the editor of the Mala Chronicle. I'm killing this. <laughs> it's reproduced here with permission from the Society of Preservation of Obscure Fictions. Ooh. To be complete is to be enclosed. Find yourself contained within the margins of your own body and the boundaries of collective reason. To be complete is to be able to see the an edge, edge of true history. Oh, yay. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. It's loud. Grab that bad boy. Uh, it's not picking up. Okay, run away from it then. Oh. So loud. It wouldn't let me pick it up, I don't think. This is really pretty. My goodness, this is pretty. Stop ringing, dude. God, you're so loud. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what to do. What are, what's with these paper airplanes, though? I still might pick up this dang phone. God dang, giant phone, dude. I don't know how to pick it up. I... <clears throat> Help me. Help me, Tom Cruise. Oh my god. Please, there's no phone that rings this long. Help me. <laughs> oh, is it the little phone? Pick this bad boy up then. Thank God. <laughs> that was awful. Hello. Well, hello to you too, my friend. Uh, it ain't doing nothing. Hello. Namaskar Sahib, an electric burst crackles in response and then pauses. I wish to speak to a ghost. Why do you want to speak to a ghost? Who are oh, I have options. Who are you? I am a weaver of circumstance and the giver of meaning. I am the connoisseur of memory. I am the last author and the first historian of time. I am uh, Sutaradatar, a narrator. So tell me, is there a ghost I'm speaking to? Yes, there is. I am a ghost. Oh, Sutaradatar. Long have I waited for your arrival. Time has silted around me, enfolding in his me in a history where I do not belong. Complete the story, narrate an end to the endless waiting. Complete your story, asked the voice. Whatever do you mean? I cannot bear to persist anymore. I've waited for the I've waited an eternity for this liberation. Send me back to the furrows of memory where I can be forgotten. Is that no not what you have called over the phone, asking to speak to a ghost? Oh no no, laments the voice. I seek a ghost, Sahib, yes. But I know nothing about your particular predicament. I seek a ghost to help me remember. Remember? Remember what? My stories, tales of emerald viceroys and Viceroys and indolent pashas of crocodile processions and the processions and the marriage of mountains. Stories from across the border, there I no longer belong. Stories that were taken from me, some lost and others forgotten. Forgotten? Lost? Da da da! What matter of Sutaradha <laughs> are you? Curse you and your tribe of insouciant, insouciant, Tyrants, purveyors of deceit and polluters of time. See ye by, says the voice and stops, as if hesitant to commit a course that would entangle it in search with my own. Curse you! Curse you! Okay. I am shouting now, fearful of losing this one chance to escape. Each grain of time that I must abide scours my soul. Let me loose from this entanglement of my tail, or I shall drag you to this nether world of a town. To wait eternity alongside me. Patience, Sahib. Sabra Karo. Sutradar. Sutrad. Sutradar. I don't know how to say it. Its voice quavering. <laughs> quavering. Well, whether with distance or the strain of our conversation, I cannot tell. You mentioned a town, Sahib. Tell me 
more about this town. Perhaps I can remember some of your story were you to describe to me where you are. What can I say of the town? It has narrow lanes and tall buildings. Oh, look at us. Believe it or not, it's just me. Remember, I picked the second choice option because I want to see if there's two endings. Second choice option for everything. Look at that. Oh, uh, busting open the doors. Is that, ooh, what is this? This game is freaking pretty though, for real. Two real five me. Okay. Let's go, let's see if we can open this door before I go open that door. Can I jump? No, you can't jump, so this is dead end. This is an old phone. Oh, is that it? Oh, no. I haunt this town, yes. I wander through its clinics and offices, halls and passages, the empty boarding house, and Carcanos have been home to me. I linger in the small corner where they kept the shrine, and I wait beside doorways that are shuttered, but most of all, I haunt this room. A room? Ah. All story ferments in rooms. Tell me more about this room that you haunt. Describe it to me. I can see the sky where the roof has fallen. It is a ca cavernous room with covered with by a broken broken roof. Uh, second choice. What the crap? Why am I back over here? What? Okay, so apparently, you're like, and I'm back. I see it now. I can see it. Sahib, clear as day. Oh no, 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 there's three choices. The voice reverberates with the panic of sudden realization. I know the place you speak of. Why it is the record, record rooms, records room at Telephone Nagar. It cannot, could be no other. Of that, I'm certain. Telephone Nagar. What manner of place is that? A frontier town, so he built on the fulcrum of time, a town that ripened and burst long ago and spewed so many tales from its verdant core that I can no longer discern distinct stories from my memory of this place. But surely you must know something that can help. Wrong! Fragment, that is all I need. Anything that explains why I'm here. Condemned to wait here. All right, Sahib, since you insist, I will tell you the story of Iqbal and the death of Telephone Nagar. <laughs> Press the phone to my ear and await the tale. Hit me with it. Boom. Our story begins on Wednesday, the 28th of August, 1833, when slavery was abolished everywhere except in territories ruled by the East India Company. It was then that an Irish doctor named William Brooke O'Shaughnessy decided that the world was porous and riddled with invisible arteries that only he could see. Even as slave owners were being paid compensation, as if freedom was an infringement that had to be reparated, William sat in a garret overlooking the Hooghly River and pondered the arterial conduits of trade and commerce that had washed him like an errand corpuscle upon the shores of this enslaved country. William, I was trying to see. Yet, and propelled by such sanguine visions, he percolated into Hindustan, soaking through barriers of Bengal and Orisha as an assistant surgeon, seeping into Bihar as an opium merchant, diffusing across the Malwa landscape in search of all for the mint, and permeating into history with his telegraph wires. From pharmacology to the galvanic cell, William used every science known to man to piece together a country that baffled him and threatened to close its paws against his probing investigations. I don't know anything about this. Over my head. Yes, yes, I am getting to that. Ten years into this project, William O'Shaughnessy found himself in the desert of Tok, along with a grand caravan of miners and salt merchants, looking for veins of copper. No settlements punctuated this land except the strange scaffolds built by nomadic barbers who eked a miserable existence here. The desert which began north of Mutsiapur infringed into the territories of Sindh with an unnerving abandon. No delineations marked this border, and in a country that was slowly being distributed into small containers, this was indeed a strange place. I've been to the desert talk, it is a certain west wasteland. Oh, here we are. The Desert of Talk. Phenomenal. 
Uh, let's go to the closest ringy thing. Oh, there's a farm. Come here, boy. Whoa! Uh, can I pick this one up? How you doing? Nope, this ain't the right farm. What about you? Oh, this is the one. But Oshonaki, to whom the world was poorest regardless of where he might be, could see not but fissures and crevices in this land, holes in the earth, that leaked its minerals like open wounds. And here amidst meager deposits of salt and copper he discovered a deep fissure full of bakelite. So burdened was the find, that within a few feet of digging into the crust, the small nodules of bakelite gave way to crystalline obelisks and protrusions of diodes and receivers. Within 20 feet, deposits of complete telephone started to emerge from the ground. Whoa. Weird. Indeed. Rich were the mines, but this burden fine was located in that part of Tok which was deep within the independent territory of Find. Though this might not have been evident to Oshonathi at the time of discovery, it was certainly clear to the head assayer who had procured a remarkable map for this expedition. I cannot tell you what this realization led to, but suffice to say that the head assayer was a distant cousin of Charles Napier, who called his illegal annexation of Sind that very year. A noble piece of rascality. How do you punish a man if he steals an entire country? Mm. With possession of the mines now secure, William O'Shaughnessy embarked upon the greatest mining endeavor of 19th century India. Teams of workers were conscripted and local barbers coerced to dig the first exploratory shafts. Teakwood trunks from the Wasta forests were dragged like a giant caterpillar to mm -hmm. be tuned into shacks and offices, and to shore the mud and rock of the tunnels being dug. Geologists, cavalrymen and medical practitioners, telegraph operators, wiremen, electricians, bankers, hostelers and camp cooks, entertainers and crooks, all descended upon the site as the first tunnels were inaugurated. What year was this? Of what use are exact dates and years? Does it not suffice to say that the mines, which were as yet shallow, only about 30 feet deep, had already begun to yield great numbers of telephones, some small and delicate, and some as large as an elephant. Yes, I have seen such great specimens in, my, in the town. Uh oh. Observation decks and elevator shafts were built. Great rotating wheels were erected to pump air into the mines. For one whole week, a train of camels unloaded grass lamps from the port that was stored in a newly built warehouse. Clothing kirkhanas were set up that were star soap chewed into hard shoes for the miners and made cotton scarves for the supervising Europeans. Elephants were shipped to the inhospitable desert at great cost to help pull and tug the telephones from their ponic bed. What of the people themselves? It became telephones. Yes, the people. The well mining crews from Srinagar and Burma, from Ceylon and Hampi and Kadirmuga, started to descend upon the settlement and were readily hired. Abutting their mine shafts, there erupted countless hovels of worker colonies, or what were to be later called Khan Paras. And a little removed from the mine, there arose larger buildings for quarters and offices, churches and workshops. Each a thin-walled ramshackle structure that hooked into the sky. Until from the nothingness of the desert, there emerged a misshapen town. Misshapen town, indeed. Oh, here we are again. Is this the same phone? Do I interact with it or do we move on this time? Ah. William O'Shaughnessy, who was appointed Director General of Telegraphs for his discovery of the Bakelite pits, received a knighthood in 1866 for the telephone mines. And though he left the town a little after its founding, he gave a name to the settlement, calling it Telephone Nigger. Faithful name, it has proven. And with newfound prosperity, there appeared like a tide of locusts, hordes of officers and revenue clerks, managers and traders, accountants and mushi, members of that peculiar race who speak both Ferengi and Hindustani. A race of administrative service officers, the lower magistrates and the adjunct collectors. Indians who had been trained abroad for just such tasks of collating the whims of change. Vultures, I spit in derision at the memory of these baboos. 
of us. I don't know how to say these words. I'm sorry. This new and formless settlement attracted them, this absence of discrete boundaries. Where else could you live in such proximity to the British, the Dutch or the Americans who worked alongside them? Where else were you allowed to so clearly see what being an equal might be like? Not that they were equal. They were separate living quarters, of course, separate messes and places of worship and even separate streets. But to be so close to the foreigners was exhilarating. Foolish to be so enthralled. Perhaps they were foolish. But remark these men, for they are crucial to our tale. It was these men, these officers of the company, who on a borderless land, discovered a finite margin. For it was against the nebulous assault of sand and mud, and the uncertainties of the mining pit, that they could delineate their own form and purpose. Somehow the harsh land erased other loyalties and helped keep the delicate balance of their lives in careful accord with their rulers. To this strange Melia arrived Iqbal. Iqbal? I know I said that one right because she said it first. <laughs> yes. Iqbal the barrister. Iqbal the revolutionary. Iqbal the unfortunate. Or, simply, Iqbal. He came to this town riding a roving tide of humanity and attempting to efface the terrible years he had spent at Hertfordshire before being appointed the administrator of the Ambrose Shaft, the deepest taxes mine at Telephone Nigger. Hmm. Save for his morning rounds, Iqbal rarely went to the actual mine. The rest of the day he spent in the cavernous records hall, maintaining a careful roster for the teams under his charge. It is the same hall that you haunt today, turning such records as have survived into paper planes in your bodom. Ah. I guess. I'll say ah, uh, I don't understand, <laughs> but there are paper airplanes. What am I doing with the records? Why would I do such a thing? I'm having a hard time following this story. There's a little bit too much information that I don't understand. Hmm. Maybe somebody else is understanding it. I don't, really. Perhaps it was the emptiness of this hall when the rest of the town was crowded, but something gave Iqbal room to ponder. ponder. Why was the telephone mined in only a single language, he wondered. Each telephone, once extracted, was refined and processed such that it would allow English to be spoken through its receiver. No other language would transmit. That's weird. Da, 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 da. Perhaps it was the emptiness of this hall when the rest of the town was crowded. But what? something gave Iqbal room to ponder. Why was the telephone mined in only a single language? He wondered. Each telephone, once extracted, was refined and processed such that it would only allow English to be spoken through its receiver. No other language would transmit. And this bothered Iqbal, who knew as we all do that telephones in India have long predated the British Raj. Why even Tughlaq was known to have shifted to Daltarbad to avail the magnificent, naturally exposed telephone that sat like a boulder upon his palace grounds. Our old telephones all but vanished when the Mughal, Mughal Sartaj saw fit to ban them. Yes, they may have been forgotten. But, Iqbal believed that some small change in the refinement or extraction process might be enough to yield a modern beaker-like hmm. telephone that could speak in many languages, perhaps even all of them. Such radical thoughts he kept to himself. And, when time permitted he experimented, for his was the legacy of a Shaughnessy. And he found it easy to bend wires and tubes to his will. And much as O'Shaughnessy had done, he too began to think of the world as a porous body waiting to be punctured by cables and pipes carrying blood and sound. Hmm. Reticent though he was, word of Iqbal's experiments percolated through the town and roused a deep anxiety in his fellow officers. Those who had prided themselves on their certainties saw in Iqbal's endeavor a malevolent threat to their way of life, for their certainties were born of a particular kind of fear. The telephone was a sacred emblem of their station as the chosen ones. They feared its proliferation and they feared its authority. To so debase such an august instrument was tantamount to sacrilege. Of this they were certain. Violence comes easily to men who are certain. Yes, it does. 
and at telephone eager. This violence erupted when Iqbal proclaimed that he had perfected the first Urdu telephone and that he awaited a phone call to test its efficacy. Oh man. This proclamation that killed I'm scared. Iqbal. They pushed him into a shaft that he supervised and he fell 1,203 feet into a hole called Ambrose. Oddly specific. Until every bone was crushed like binder, and his flesh so deeply lacerated that it left a streak of blood, marking the passage of his body down the shaft. Allah have mercy. Dun, dun, dun. Day, with forced joviality, left the horror of their crime be made. Ooh, is that me? The murderers and their masters filed into the records room with a new camaraderie. As they reached for their muster sheets, they were startled to discover Iqbal seated upon his usual tree, waiting besides his telephone. Mm. His face was still lacerated and his mien was the color of a white dhoti. His limbs contorted in odd shapes with bones protruding the flesh. And his teeth rattled as he spoke in garbled bursts. But there he was, Iqbal. Or what was left of him. A ghost! Like me! I'm a ghost. The Supposedly. sight of Iqbal animated the memory of his murder. The record room was boarded up, though no one remarked upon the folly of entombing a ghost. People were prostituted. The mines were abandoned. The shafts destroyed in a riot. The city dwindled and then, just as suddenly as it had begun, Telephone Nigger became an empty husk floating upon a sea of sand, leaving just the ghost of Iqbal, awaiting his phone call. Do you believe I am Iqbal? I ask wondering if I indeed am Iqbal. Possibly. I do not know Sahib. All I can recall is Iqbal also awaited a phone call in the empty town of Telephone Nigger. That he too awaited a release from this purgatory that was to be heralded. Oh man. To which he would say. Hello. That's what I said. Alright guys, so if no matter what answer choice you pick, it seems to end up at the same place regardless. It loops around to the hello. But it was a pretty good game. The graphics are phenomenal. It was really short and it was mostly just listening to the story, but the story is pretty interesting. And it's good that it has narration in it, so you can hear some of the words and how they were supposed to be pronounced instead of getting butchered by me. But as always, thanks for watching. If you could, please like and subscribe. Bye!